there's really no way to prepare for your first film. I, I mean, uh, you can do all the film school you want or whatever, but I think being naive is part of what goes into it and you'll never get that again and it adds so much character to your, to your first project. Hi, I'm Raihan Salam and this is the Vice Podcast Show. I'm joined today by Gia Coppola, writer and director of Palo Alto. Mr. B is a hottie. Do you know he wants to get it in with April? <laughs> no, he doesn't. Why would you say that? Mr. Morrison, given the support you have from the community, the court would like to give you one last chance to turn your life around. Try not to hang around Fred. Dude, you can't be here. You just don't care about anything. I wish I didn't care about anything. This party sucks. I'm older and I know that there aren't a lot of good things around. And I know that you are really good. Why do you have to try so hard to seem crazy? Do you even think she's pretty? She's pretty. I don't think she's that pretty. I corrected your paper. You could have just corrected it. You didn't have to rewrite the whole thing. <laughs> down the tunnel of death. You're young. You don't know why you do things. But there's always a reason. <laughs> Gia, thanks very much for joining me. Thank you. So, Palo Alto is based on a series of short stories by James Franco. Tell us a little bit about how you first encountered the stories. Um, I, met, I met James super randomly. I, I was at a deli in Los Angeles and I saw him there. And Where all great things happen. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was just kind of giggling. Like, I, I'm a big fan of him, so I was just like, oh my god, there he is. And then uh, later that night I ran into him and we got introduced um, and I said, you know, I saw you earlier today and he had remembered and we just kind of were talking about like what we were interested in and I had just finished college and was a photography major so I was talking about that and my photography and so we stayed in touch and then in that in that sort of process of um, kind of exchanging emails, he and I wanted to collaborate in some kind of way and one of them, one of the ideas that he mentioned was like he had this book about um, Palo Alto stories and about uh, teenagers and um, it sounded really appealing to me just because I had I'd finished college and had enough separation to kind of look at those teenage awkward teenage years somewhat fondly and um, but he said he wanted to make it into a feature film and so I kind of read the book with that in mind and I just really loved the book and was excited by the chance and you know he made it, it in a safe environment for me to not feel intimidated and um, and, and it took me through it step by step. This was your first movie, and there are a lot of aspiring filmmakers for whom the idea of just getting started is amazingly intimidating. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about how you approached it and what were some of the challenges you faced. There's really no way to prepare for your first film. I, I mean, uh, you can do all the film school you want or whatever, but I think, uh, it, there's something so beautiful about making your first film because all the the mistakes that you make and the naive decisions of just, I don't know, being naive is part of what goes into it and you'll never get that again and it adds so much character to your, to your first project. But, I mean, it's a, it's this, there's so much technology now too that it's really kind of great that anyone can kind of really get into making a movie. You don't have Were to. you using digital video? Were you using pretty low cost tools to make the movie? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we were super low budget and small crew and that was sort of fun. We were just like kind of 
a, a student film in a sense. The kids lived at my mom's house and I'd drive them to work and she'd cook them dinner. And <laughs> it's all in the behind the scenes. That's going to air on Vice. Oh, and that's you can tremendous. see the making of how we did this. <laughs> wow. Uh, so your mother clearly deserves a lot of credit for the making. Yeah. If they had not been fed, uh, you know, they would not have been able to act quite so well. <laughs> yeah, they got some good meals out of her. This is the beginning. Just wait. Do you think you'll get used to it? Yeah. I mean, the camera that we're using, you know, is like, not this camera. Yeah, so. I know, that's a, it's a lot the bigger. I feel like anybody that has a camera in their face all the time, you just get used to it. I've told Gia some of the real stories or about the real people behind the characters I wrote. And she always says, like, I can't believe so many crazy things happened in your high school. King. No, you can't be king, dog. No way. Because I'm a king around these parts. I always had a hard time in high school. When James gave me his stories, I hadn't really seen anything that articulated that emotion when you're that age. It, it really kind of resonated in the, with me and I related to it. So I was really excited by this chance. It rains a lot this time of year. Teenagers are great subjects for art because it is such a raw period. It is a period where every little act seems like the end of the world. It's about universal emotions of what you go through as a young person. There's something challenging about adapting a series of short stories as uh, you don't necessarily have a single linear narrative. Tell me a little bit about how you thought about which pieces uh, to turn into your story, uh, you know, how you went about selecting the stories you found most compelling. I think because I didn't, I've never made a first, uh, a feature film that I, it was sort of to my advantage to not really know what I was getting into and like maybe the hard parts about using just sort of these short stories for a feature length narrative. But it, James really took me through it step by step and he said, just kind of pick the stories that you like first and then write them as these individual screenplays. So we, we did that. And then after I did... And which were the stories you liked the most? The ones that I um, worked with were um, Chinatown, April in Three Parts, Jacko, Halloween, and Emily. Um, and I mean, they're all great, but... Uh, and they're interconnected as well. There are some similarities between some of them, so I was able to kind of uh, combine the characters. But having had these sort of separate screenplays, James said, you know, take one of them and make a short kind of test film with your friends. And in that process, I was able to kind of discover what was working and what wasn't working. And, and then take these sort of separate screenplays and combine them and intertwine them in, in ways that made it more of an ensemble. April in Three Parts is clearly one of the hearts of the movie. So tell us a bit about the story. I just kind of really loved that story of this, you know, it, it goes back and forth between the young female perspective, April, and then the young boy, Teddy, and it's just kind of their missed opportunity of liking each other and not really being able to express how they feel. and. It was a little bit of like a little a Romeo and Juliet kind of. She gets entwined with her s soccer coach and and does isn't really aware of the boy that is probably better for her and likes her. And it's just a really sweet kind of romantic story. And there was a lot of because it was longer. There was a lot about the characters that you got to know them a little bit better. 
you mentioned that when you started working on the project, you were just out of college. Um, and I wonder, did you spend any time thinking about how adolescence had changed and even that short amount of time? Uh, I'm just curious to hear about you know, your thoughts about how your own adolescent experience informed how you view the stories uh, and how you constructed your own story. Um, yeah, I had like a year since I'd finished college and I was just like, I was working, studying bartending. I was just kind of figuring out what I liked. But I had a really hard time in high school. I just, I didn't know what I wanted to do and I wasn't excelling academically. And it was just really kind of disheartening to just always not really be good at anything and not really relate to any, anybody. And, um, and it was hard in that moment, but, but as I got older, I was kind of able to understand that those are just sort of growing pains and everyone sort of has that within an extent. Um, and, you know, I thought I was sort of close enough to the material where I could, I could um, be able to make a modern version of these kind of teenager stories because I, I had just kind of gone through it. But when I was filming it and getting to know these kids, I really realized how kind of dated I was and they would keep me updated on like, oh no, we wouldn't say that anymore. It's fascinating. <laughs> yeah. so, so, I mean, literally in terms of, is it just a question of slang or is it literally that kids were relating to each other differently? I think it was more just a question of slang and like what was cool and I, th I think we all, go through those sort of universal experiences. Even my older relatives were like, could relate to Palo Alto because they've all f felt like that or had a friend like that. And um, it's just in different settings now. And One thing I was really struck by is that the characters in your film, the adolescents in particular, they all seem very incomplete. They seem, some of them seem very vulnerable. Some of them are very angry. And yet there's this absence of adults who are solid, reliable, and supportive. And the adults that we do see are in some cases predatory. Uh, and in some cases, um, they're just themselves. So mm. weirdly immature that they kind of behave in, in very weird ways. Is this something that resonated with your actors and with you in terms of the, the landscape, the teenage landscape that you were familiar with? Just a world in which you don't feel like you have solid authority figures who make you feel loved and safe? I just kind of remember that moment when you're young and you realize that adults and authority figures are human beings too and they're just as flawed and figuring out their lives like you are and, and they don't have all the answers. And so I was just trying to kind of come across that sort of perspective and view it, them through their eyes rather than just saying that they're all, all the adults in their lives are flawed. It's just kind of through their eyes and um, uh, yeah. There's this scene uh, in which April is coming to uh, her stepfather who is playing a violent video game and then he kind of casually <laughs> hands over a paper that he wrote for her when he had asked, or maybe hadn't even asked, uh, for him to proofread it, essentially. And she just accepts it resignedly. You know, you could tell that she was a little disappointed that he felt the need to rewrite it or whatever else. And it was just funny, just, you know, this figure of the stepfather, you know, someone who is this not necessarily negative or dark presence, but someone who is just trying to be helpful in this way that seems so clueless about her developing as a person. And then the way in her relationship with her mother, which you see in fragments, seems to really just want to be her friend um, and is kind of playful with her, which can be very sweet. But uh, I just couldn't help but think, this doesn't seem to be what she needs. Yeah, well, I wanted to kind of give a little background as to why April's going to be vulnerable enough to kind of fall into the trap of Mr. B. And um, I think that there was a little bit of lack of kind of understanding and, and maybe even love, just because, and that's why she... It, uh, James's character makes her feel like she's an adult. So for the girls, and particularly for April, because we don't see the same relationships with the parents for the other girls. Okay, so she has these parental figures who are not malevolent, you know, but they're just doing it wrong <laughs> in mm. some deep way. Whereas with the boys, um, with Teddy, for example, who in many respects is the most sympathetic and kind of sweet character in the movie, uh, but who just acts out. Mm -hmm. like a bastard, uh, mm -hmm. you know, he just kind of, uh, you know, yelling at a cop in this one, you know, very 
intense scene. Um, and then his parents also, or his family rather, I mean, they're kind of, tell me about that. I mean, the difference between the relationship that April has with her family versus Teddy and Fred, these boys who actually are a lot more obviously self-destructive, whereas April is self-destructive in this kind of hidden way. Well, I feel like, I mean, you don't really see uh, Teddy's mom that much, but I feel like she's trying and she's she's not as kooky as some of the other uh, adult figures in the movie, but um, it was really kind of the influence of the friends that you make at that age and, and Fred, uh, Teddy's best friend, is sort of the one that keeps kind of steering him off the wrong path. And, and those are, it's really, a, being that age is so important in, in your development and it's, it's important who your friends are and I was just kind of trying to understand that and um, with April I just kind of felt like there needed to be something lacking at home to kind of make her go with Mr. B and, and be vulnerable as I said to, to that. Yeah. So you see April's relationship with her soccer coach as kind of the central thread of the movie is that fair to say? Um, not necessarily. I feel like it's kind of more between, even though they're not in the same, they're rarely in a scene together, I feel like April and Teddy's sort of relationship of trying to kind of connect with each other, but there's different things in their lives that are just kind of steering them in different directions and kind of their, these two young kids' journeys. And I want to talk to you about the way that pretty much every sexual relationship depicted in the movie is not, I guess what I think of as kind of the adolescent introduction to sexuality because I'm really naive, <laughs> but I think of it as this kind of having a sense of humor, it's tender, it's awkward, mm -hmm. there's kind of trial and error, and you know, but it's fundamentally, it can be innocent and sweet and not just terrible, whereas pretty much every sexual relationship in the movie has an incredibly dark undertone. Um, now, you know, we've talked a little bit about April and Mr. B, and, you know, even from the very beginning, I mean, these other girls on the soccer team are just intimating that, you know, he's interested in you, and uh, uh, tell me, tell me a bit about that, I mean, tell me a bit about that relationship and your response to it. Well, James's book is, is really dark material, and I felt like that was sort of um, a good challenge for me uh, as, I guess, an artist to try and figure out how to, to, to make this material work within my kind of creative range and, and push myself to, to use material that's out of my comfort zone. And, and so, and, and those were kind of the moments I enjoyed the most was like, you know, even though I didn't necessarily have the same uh, could relate to Emily's story, I felt like it was still a very important story to kind of to, to tell and, and to try to, to, to figure out how, how am I going to tell this in a way that I'm comfortable with. And so, you know, doing little moments like voiceovers or the kind of uh, more montage-y, I don't like the word montage, but uh, moment between April and Mr. B in, in the bed in the, on the couch were kind of my ways of, of telling those stories. When also just about the way that Mr. B, who I think early on comes across as a kind of benevolent, sad, sacky kind of figure complaining about going on dates and whatever else, and then the seduction and manipulation and the sense that uh, I thought that that was really interesting, yet, you know, you, you mentioned earlier on this realization that adolescents sometimes have, mm. that adults are flawed mm -hmm. people. And I wonder if that's how you see Mr. B, because I certainly can imagine watching this movie and thinking, well, actually, no, um, he's using his age and his power uh, to be incredibly manipulative, to do things like to tell this kid who perhaps is not loved enough um, that he loves her. You know, I mean, just these kind of very powerful things. But I mean, do you see him more as himself, a kind of flawed, broken person, or do you see him as someone who is um, kind of a villain? I mean, let's put it bluntly. Uh, when I was writing it, to, what was helpful for me was to try and understand where all these characters were coming from. And so I didn't want to be judgmental. And, and James and I talked about, you know, where is this, 
why is Mr. B doing the things he's doing? And I think he was just kind of, in a way, stunted emotionally, and he just can't really relate to women his own age, and he's kind of at the sort of maturity level of, of a young younger girl. And, um, and, and I think maybe there's something, you know, in the 1800s, there, men were marrying women at 14, so maybe there was just sort of something kind of, um, what's the word? Uh, but, so we were just trying to kind of understand what, what, are, what maybe his logic or where he's coming from. It, and I, he obviously doesn't view himself as, as a predator or anything like that. Yeah, I mean, I think that at least if you take him at his word, it's as though he felt this strong feeling of romantic love and mutual understanding. And I guess it's an open question. I mean, was that purely deceptive on his part? Or as you say, like, was it just such a lack of maturity and lack of self-control yeah. that, uh, that was the culprit? I, I like to believe that he genuinely loved her. And then, you know, there's, I don't want to give it away, but th there's a moment when she kind of has a realization that she needs to be with boys her own age. And in that sort of break period, you know, he finds another, relates with another young girl and it's just sort of a bad, a bad pattern. Emily uh, is, to me, one of the most compelling aspects of the movie. I'm not sure I'd necessarily call her the most compelling character, partly because, um, you know, I think deliberately, um, we don't necessarily get a very rich sense of her motivations. Mm. But tell us a bit about Emily. Well, I was working with the great actress, Zoe Levin, and she just brought a lot of soulfulness to that kind of character, which could be gen generally kind of more cliche and like typecasted as a slut, but you know, she brought a lot of heart and this character just wants to be loved and is making bad decisions because of it. So basically, you know, because Emily wants to be loved, she is very quick to um, engage in kind of sexual intimacy with people and it seems that this has been a pattern with a variety of different people. But she certainly latched on to one of the male characters, Fred, and, and I wonder, why do you think that was? I think Fred's really charming. I mean, I mean even of Teddy likes him a lot. He's fun, he's funny, he sings, he, he kind of dances. So I think that he's definitely a, a appealing. It's just that it's... It's an interesting kind of charm. I mean, there's yeah. definitely like a, a kind of aggro dimension to it. Yeah. <laughs> so with Emily, there's this one incredibly affecting scene in the movie where she's actually not even talking. Rather, Fred is narrating. Um, uh, a kind of what sounds a lot like sexual assault uh, mm -hmm. involving um, uh, a number of boys. And, and I guess this could be one of those things where you know, maybe it's an unreliable narrator or whatever else, but you, know, you, you kind of see Emily and you see the dead eyes. And I, I kind of wonder, um, you know, with that, what were you trying to convey with it? Um, because you know we, we don't see the sequence. We kind of don't even know if it necessarily really happened. Uh, but uh, tell us a bit about that se sequence. Well, that was one of the examples of like the material in James's book that was really hard to kind of digest, but it was important, and it's no reason for me to shy away from it. And so we tried a lot of different ways of, how, uh, of figuring out how to involve that narrative into the story, and that was the way that kind of best suited it and, and the film kind of told us that this was the right way and um, I like the the kind of, I guess, mystery of whether or not it happened and, and leaving it up to the audience to kind of have their own interpretation of, of what they think was going on and, and yeah, but I mean that stuff goes on and so it's, it's dark. It's not just the girls who get caught up in this maelstrom of sex and power. There is one very surprising scene, a very kind of incomplete scene, um, in which Teddy has a strange encounter with the father of one of his good friends. Um, and I wonder, I mean, is this a theme that you wanted to draw out more, or did you just want to make a kind of reference to it by way of saying that, you know, it's not just girls who kind of experience this kind of power exerted on them? I think there was an element of me kind of wanting to, to say that, but also, you know, movies are a collaboration, and I was working with a wonderful actor, Chris Messina, and we kind of, there was a scene in the book that was similar to this, but we took it to a whole nother level of like, you know, he said, 
why don't I hit on Jack Kilmer? And I said, that's great, but I'm not going to tell him. And so all of that kind of was very authentic, and Jack felt very uncomfortable. So it was actually improvised? That was all improvised, and we got, you know, Chris Messina's amazing because he could control it in like a one-shot scene and give me the right amount so it's not like totally rambling. That's amazing <laughs> because it was a genuinely extremely creepy scene. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> so, you know, Yeah, it's one that's one of my favorite So obviously, you know, kind of, obviously some of that's very good acting, but also yeah. some of that is creating this tension in a very organic kind of way. Yeah. Tell me about your use of improvisation throughout the film, because obviously, you know, you had a tremendous cast. Um, you know, a lot of these are, are, are kind of really well-regarded uh, young actors, uh, as well as people who've been around the business uh, their whole lives. So, uh, you know, did these kids provide you with a lot of input creatively? Yeah, I always say that it was, it's like a filtration. I mean, it goes from my, uh, James's book to uh, my writing and then to the actors and they start to know the characters better than I do. And, and I enjoyed all those sort of moments when uh, they kept the scenes fresh and surprised me and brought new things to the table. And um, I just tried to be open and honest and, and I, I I liked hearing what, they know the characters better than me, so I liked hearing. This is a silly question, but <laughs> so there's a way in which the translation from the short stories to your writing involves one set of transformations to the characters. Then there's another from your written page to how the actors interpret the roles. Which stage saw the biggest leap? Would you say that you know, your actors made actually a real contribution to kind of um, you know, what what the stories were essentially, or kind of how, uh, I'm, I'm just kind of curious about how much of an input they made. Uh, well, it keeps going after that. I mean, just the daily grind that you're faced with on set, just to the weather constraints, to, you know, oh, we don't have the money, or something fell, location dropped out, you know, all those things that you're faced with are also part of what happens in making your movie. And then the edit, you really discover what's working and what's not, and you can control it in a whole nother way. So. So it's a constant incremental... Yeah, you really have to kind of let... It, it, the film tells you what it wants to be and it takes its own life from, you know, your preconceived initial idea. Um, but I, I was working with great actors and, and I I picked actors that were right for their part and so I, I trusted them to, to, to collaborate. I, I enjoy collaborating with everyone. It, that's what makes it fun. You are... Uh, a young person who's obviously very accomplished. And I wonder, because as I watched this movie, I just kept thinking to myself, these kids are being thrust into insanely difficult situations, and they're being thrust into these situations without a lot of resources, without a lot. They're obviously fabulously wealthy. I mean, that's just a baseline for pretty much all the kids in the movie. But not the resources of just that kind of love and support that allows them to kind of make their way in the world. Mm -hmm. So I wonder, I mean, there are going to be teenagers who are going to watch your movie. Do you have any thoughts for them just about, you know, and, and kids who are going to identify with things that happen in it and some of the challenges these kids face? I hope that you know, they can watch it and not feel so alone in what they're going through and, and that it's just a natural course of growing up and your body changes and hormones happen. But I feel like... I feel like the answer for me when, when growing up that really helped me, and I think with James, is like once you find kind of what you're interested in and have a passion for something, it can really help um, steer you away from being influenced by things that, uh, you know, could deter you from or take you down the wrong path. It can give your life some structure. Yeah. Why photography? You mentioned that you had studied it, and I wonder, because the movie is beautiful. I mean, I think that shot by shot uh, just, um, you know, it... it felt to me like a mood piece. Um, and the reason why it was so rich and resonant is because of how amazing everything looked and how things were framed. Uh, so you know, obviously photography is something that matters a lot to you, but tell me about what drew you to it initially. Um, I, I was just kind of taking pictures with Polaroids. Uh, that would be kind of my present to my mom on her birthday. Or like, I knew my dad really enjoyed photography, so when I was younger I got his camera and I'd play around with that, but it wasn't really until um, I, I, um, I, long story, if you want to go into it, I, I dropped out of high school and got my GED and I, I was going to community college and I was just enjoying kind of 
learning and picking the classes I liked, but I missed the sense of community and I wanted to go to a, a four-year college, a liberal arts college, and, and I had chosen that I really wanted to go to Bard College because there was this professor there, Stephen Shore, and he's a photographer I admire, and I just knew I really wanted a great teacher in my life. and. So I signed up and, and thankfully I got in and, and Stephen just really um, inspired me and taught me to enjoy learning and, and because, you know, the program there isn't so much about technica technicality and it's just kind of coming up with ideas and um, following through with them and he's just super wise and intelligent and so I just enjoyed um, that, that having that person as a mentor and so when I finished, I, I just felt like uh, filmmaking was like an ex extension of photography, but you know, more elements to play with and it can be a more collaborative experience. It's fascinating, so that goes right back to what you'd said a moment ago, I mean, being having been a little bit of a loner in this one context, but then having found something that you loved. And yeah. Tell me about what you want to work on next. What are you thinking about? Because you know, obviously this has already been well received as a film. Um, and I think that you're going to help make the careers of a lot of really talented young actors. I hope so. um, <laughs> but I wonder about um, you know what the next project is going to be. Um, I've been writing, so I, I'm going back to that sort of phase of things, and uh, I hope to, to do something with James again. Let's have him in mind. <laughs> Is there a set of questions? Because I mean, this was a particular kind of milieu you were looking at, the milieu of adolescence, um, you know, and obviously through James's short stories, but also drawing on your insights and experiences about being an outsider. Um, is there a set of themes and questions that you think you'd want to tackle in another project or that you're writing about now? I'm so excited by so many different um, genres of movies and it's fun for me to kind of challenge myself in a new way. I don't, I don't. Um, Sci-fi, horror, It could comedy. be, it could be. I would watch that. <laughs> I would be into trying to try to tell that story, it'd be new. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate Thank you. it. <laughs>